Okay, everyone, welcome this morning. Can everyone hear me okay? I can hear you, yep. Great, okay, great. Welcome, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, excited to uh, have three great panelists on today uh, to talk about the environmental challenges that are facing uh, South Florida and um, how financial uh, modeling tools are helping us to assess those risks and what the federal frameworks are and state frameworks are for uh, mitigating some of those hazards. Uh, so I'd like to introduce, I'd like to start by uh, introducing Devin uh, Tibor of the College of Law at FIU, who is, uh, helps run the Environmental Law Society. Uh, Devin, would you like to offer a few words? Yeah, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. And thank you again for joining us. Uh, for the first of a series of annual interdisciplinary events on natural and anthropogenic environmental issues ho uh, hosted by the College of Law. My name is Devin Tibor. As Professor Loyola said, I am president of FIU's Environmental Law Society, which is a student organization dedicated to educating law students and the general public on the intersection of law and the environment. I really quickly want to thank Dean Manuel Gomez and the FIU Global Legal Studies Initiative, as well as Professor Loyola and the FIU Institute of the Environment for putting this event together. Um, today we have a great panel covering a wide array of topics such as the status of the Biscayne Aquifer, the flood and wind risk insurance programs, and disaster resistance and recovery programs. Joining us to speak, we have Dr. Todd Crowell, the director of the FIU Institute of the Environment, Dr. Shahid Amid, the Professor of Finance and Chair of the FIU Department of Finance, and Michael Drummond, Director of the National Environmental Process and Policy Practice at WSP USA. They will be moderated by Professor Mario Loyola, Director of the Environmental Finance and Risk Management Program at FIU. The ELS hopes that this event will serve to educate law students and the general public on the policy behind the preparation and mitigation of environmental hazards in the state of Florida, and how we may be able to help going forward with our careers. And with that, I'll turn it back over to our moderator, Professor Loyola. Thank you, Devin, for that excellent uh, introduction. Um, I will be, I will try to be seen, but not heard um, and as much as possible. So I will have some questions uh, for the panelists after their presentations. Uh, if anybody uh, at, at some point, hopefully uh, around 11 o'clock, uh, I will turn over, I will open the floor to questions from the audience. And, and at that point, I'll ask uh, folks in the audience to raise their hands if they would like to ask a question. Uh, in the meantime, uh, uh, Professor Crowell, take it away. All right, thank you, Professor Loyola and, and Dean Gomez for the invitation. Um, you guys see my slides? Yep. Okay. So what I want to do is introduce um, sort of the basic ecology of the South Florida landscape. And then the other panelists will discuss um, some of the issues we face and, and hopefully some of the solutions. So you don't think about South Florida without thinking about the Everglades. <clears throat> it's one of the eight iconic wetlands of the world. And, and you also, when you think about the Everglades, you think about Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, who wrote The River of Grass, and her famous quote, there are no other Everglades in the world. They're, they are have always been one of the unique regions of the earth. And indeed, the Everglades Restoration Project that I'll talk about <laughs> is the world's largest wetland restoration project in the world. So the first thing is, let's talk about the history. So the Everglades are home to the Miccosukee tribe of Indians. Um, it's, it's always been a, a place where they have lived, where they have thrived. And indeed, uh, the Miccosukee Reservation still resides near the FIU campus. Um, in the Everglades. It's also the home of some very um, iconic uh, animals, uh, including the Florida panther, um, which is on a, a highly threatened and endangered list, as well as a variety of other organisms. But what happened? So what did we do? Why are the Everglades, why is it the world's largest restoration project? Well, we started dredging the Everglades 
about 100 years ago to drain the swamp, so to speak, and to make it uh, habitable uh, for humans. Um, here's a, a simple timeline. In 1881, uh, a guy by the name of Distin bought 4 million acres. He dredged the Kissimmee River, joined that to the Caloosahatchee River, and started rice and sugar cane production. In 1908, a guy named Bullis bought, bought another 500 acres and established the Okeechobee Fruitlands Company. So what you can see is what was once a large wetland area with lakes and rivers is now becoming an agricultural uh, hotspot. In 26 and 28, the Great Miami and Okeechobee hurricanes hit and the Lake Okeechobee overtopped. Um, the, they built a levee when they linked all the rivers to the Okeechobee River and it killed thousands of people. That kicked in the Army Corps of Engineers, the USGS and others to build bigger levees and to start dredging canals to drain Lake Okeechobee to basically protect people's land and lives. And so that the water system became sort of a highly managed area to maximize agriculture and minimize flood damage and flood impacts. <clears throat> In 19, from 1930 to 1937, the Army Corps of Engineers uh, built a 66 mile long, 20 foot high dike to protect the people um, and then started digging uh, canals to drain Okeechobee and the whole watershed, both to the east, east and the west. In 1947, um, uh, we started the Florida Flood Control Program and built 14,000 miles of canals, floodgates, and pumps. So the entire landscape became managed almost like, a, 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 almost like an irrigation system. So this is what we did. We connected all this area all the way up um, uh, by Orlando, connected the Kissimmee River, all these lake systems, all the way down to Lake Okeechobee, which is at the very bottom. And this is what we now have. So we have Orlando connected all the way to Lake Okeechobee through the Kissimmee River, Caloosahatchee River, and a whole series of canals that connect all that to the Everglades and actually all the way to Biscayne Bay. And we'll talk about those connections and why they matter. So while most of the world's river systems are being disconnected, we basically took uh, an aquatic system, the Everglades, and connected it by about 400 miles, right? So everything that happens upstream impacts us all the way down now to the, to the city of Miami and lower. So on the left, you see what, we, what the pre-drainage Everglades look like. So you had Lake Okeechobee, the water flowing south and then west into the Everglades, and now because of all of the drainage and the canals going east and west, we basically cut the Everglades in half. And the water, while some water flows south, the, uh, half of the water flows to the east and the west uh, to keep the flooding down. So historic flows, the hydrology got, is severely impacted. And that's one of the major issues with Everglades restoration. So what used to be sort of south uh, uh, west flowing water is now largely flowing east and west through all the canal systems to make sure water levels are low and flood potential is minimized. What that's done, the changing in the hydrology, is the Everglades used to be made up of ridges and sloughs. And so the, the picture on the left is what a healthy ridge and slough looks like. So it's sort of water, land, water, land. And now because of the altered hydrology, this is what we have on the right. Um, basically, um, you, we've lost that ridge slough landscape and it's sort of all just a mishmash of flooded areas, dry areas, flooded areas, dry areas. So in 1947, we established the Everglades National Park. We started the, in, 80, in the 1980s, we started the Kissimmee River Restoration Project. In 1986, we started phosphorus and mercury modeling. So we understood that there were issues associated with agriculture from phosphorus and also issues associated with 
mostly atmospheric deposition of mercury <clears throat> that, that could potentially uh, affect human health. And then in 2000, and this is important to FIU, the National Science Foundation has what is called the Long-Term Ecological Research Program. And so we have 26 sites around North America that are ecosystem-based, where we are trying to understand how ecosystems function, the impacts of disturbances such as hurricanes, droughts, and floods. And, and Professor, FIU, and uh, Professor we, Kral, Kral, yeah. can I, Professor Kral, can I interrupt you for just a second and help us understand a little bit what the particular problems of phosphorus runoff. I'll, I'll, I'll get there. I'll get there. I'll, get, I'll, I'll show you. Um, so anyhow, in, in 2000, we, we were able to uh, uh, secure one of the LTR sites, the Flora Coastal Everglades site. Okay, so here's the issue that my, uh, Professor Loyola, Loyola was just talking about. The Everglades historically have been a, it has been a very clear, low phosphorus environment. Now that's odd for a wetland. Most wetlands have high phosphorus, um, they're not particularly clear, but we have a very particular geology, right? We sit on an old coral reef. And so that limestone binds the phosphorus historically and keeps it inactive, which keeps the water clear and the phosphorus levels very, very low in the water. In fact, the total phosphorus concentration historically has been less than 10 parts per, per billion. But now think about that agricultural uh, all the agricultural activity and Lake Okeechobee, which is now draining all that water from Lake Okeechobee, all the way from Orlando through Okeechobee, all the way into the Everglades. That water has very high phosphorus and that's a huge issue. So one of the things that has happened through FIU researchers is that we work with the Miccosukee tribe of Indians and set a phosphorus standard that says no water that has more than 10 parts per billion of phosphorus can enter the Everglades. And that's part of the restoration program. And that's one of our biggest challenges. It's very, very difficult to have agricultural lands that are draining through all that, because we know we add phosphorus and nitrogen to agriculture to maximize production. And all that water and all those nutrients flow down and should be going into the Everglades. But they don't because they have too much phosphorus so the Everglades are dry and only half the volume that they once were. So the limestone and then the periphyte, and this is the algae that any of you who have gone in the Everglades, you see all these big algal mats, those things remove almost all the nutrients. And so we're trying to use that, um, trying to use that biology to, to make sure that we take up as much of the phosphorus and nutrients as we can. But again, that um, because of the heavy agricultural drainage from Okeechobee and the way we manage Okeechobee, if it's a big rainstorm, we open up the gates and let the water out. We, we basically have a huge problem with that water coming down with high phosphorus. And so all these activities that we're doing called Everglades restoration are all about restoring the, the water flow but it has to be clean water. And that's the key and that's the challenge. It can't have high phosphorus because the entire Everglades system will collapse. It's a low phosphorus, clear water system. We call it the upside down uh, wetland because most wetlands, everything, all the nutrients come from the upstream and move down. In the Everglades, historically and naturally, all the phosphorus come, came from the ocean side. So from down in the Keys, that when we had big storms, when we had storm surge, when we had waves, the uh, phosphorus moved from the bottom up. And so it's a, we call it the upside down estuary, but that's in danger because of all the agricultural land and all the nutrients that are coming from Okeechobee down, okay? So now what we've got is, we've got Lake Okeechobee, we've got all of the agricultural areas. So at the North, it's too dry and dirty. Um, in the East, it's too wet and dirty. Um, we've got water flowing east and west, um, and we've got all these canal systems, and there's too little clean inflow now coming from the Keys. So the whole ecosystem is sort of in peril from all directions. We're being attacked from all directions with uh, not enough water and not enough clean water. So what we've got now is the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Program, or SERP. 
It's got 41 projects that's increased now. I think there's something like 57 projects. Um, and there are all these plans and studies going on to figure out how we're going to restore the Everglades to, to its, its historic levels um, while minimizing phosphorus. Again, the phosphorus criteria is a state law, um, which was based on FIU and Miccosukee science um, to be less than 10 parts per billion. <clears throat> the cost of this was estimated to be 10 billion. $10 billion. We now think it's closer to $18 billion. And, and I'm sure Michael and, and others will talk about that later. On top of all this, we can't forget sea level rise, right? So the future of South Florida is going to be very different. We already, based on CO2 levels in the atmosphere, know that we're going to have at least one meter of sea level rise over the next 50 to 100 years. And so the figure on the left shows you what South Florida is going to look like with the sea level rise that we know is going to happen based on a, a number of things. The ice sheets melting, water expands when it warms, and also we have subsidence of the land erosion and stuff. And so the sea level is going to rise by about a meter we, we're sure of. If we keep going in the current rate, it could rise as much as three meters, and then all of South Florida is heavily in danger. So why does that matter? Why would I bring that up when I talk about Everglades restoration? So it turns out that, remember, we, we are situated on an old coral reef. All of you have picked up coral on the beach. You pick it up. It looks like it should be a heavy rock. It's really light because it's calcium carbonate, and it's really porous. That porosity means that water moves through coral very easily. So think about what's happened. We have drained the Everglades to about half and sea level is rising. And underneath us is this porous limestone. So what is happening is it's a, it's a pressure problem. Salt water is increasing, it's pushing down, it's pushing in through the coral and it's going up into our freshwater aquifer. That aquifer is where we get all of our drinking water. It's where we get all the fresh water for agriculture and everything we depend on. So we've got low Everglades, rising sea level, and we're losing a pressure battle. And so I always talk about the fact that before your feet, before your feet get wet from sea level rise, you're gonna get thirsty because we're gonna run out of fresh water unless we restore the Everglades and get the pressure of fresh water pushing down and pushing back the salt water. And in fact, we have a whole series of groundwater wells um, throughout the Biscayne Aquifer where we get all of our water, which is the majority of our public water supply. And we already see, I think about 17% of our wells are already contaminated with salt. So we're losing a battle that's not about sea level rise and flooding. It's about losing our fresh water re, uh, resources. And that's, that's horribly, I mean, that will, that will completely eliminate the economy of South Florida. So now add to that sea level rise plus population growth. And so we had about 5.6 million people in 2010. We're going to have about 6.6 .6 million by 2030. All of us use water for drinking for you know every part of our lives. And so now we're pumping the water out of the aquifer. All right, so we got low Everglades, rising sea level, and now the aquifer is being pumped lower and lower because of all the human use. And so we're losing every possible way we can in terms of saltwater intrusion and the likelihood of, of saltwater coming in. What's more, we we now connected from Orlando all the way down to Okeechobee, all the way to the Everglades, all the way to Biscayne Bay. So this figure shows what the Biscayne Aquifer used to be. It's now co connected all the way up to Okeechobee Kissimmee River. Historically, we had the Everglades. A little bit of fresh water would flow through these sloughs, um, these what we call transverse glades. Um, a little bit of clean, remember the Everglades were clean, low nutrients, clean fresh water into Biscayne Bay. And, and we, had, we also had an abundance of shoreline vegetation. So we had uh, mangroves, then seagrass beds, then coral reefs. Those are all natural filtration systems for uh, taking out nutrients as they flow from the land into the water. So we had a very healthy, clean Biscayne Bay. 
Now, we basically have all these flood control systems. We don't have a little bit of clean, fresh water with low nutrients flowing in. We have these big canal systems, which are dumping huge amounts of fresh water into the bay, which contain lots and lots of contaminants and nutrients. And so um, most of you will know that in August, we had a massive fish kill event in Biscayne Bay. And that was basically a perfect storm. So what happened was we had very warm uh, water coming from the, from the, from the ocean. Um, because of, of temperature increases. Um, we had huge rainfall events in July and August. In fact, this year, I think, marks the wettest year of South Florida that we've measured. But we had three major uh, rainfall events in July. And when that happens, the groundwater gets saturated, the ground gets saturated, all the water sort of goes into the groundwater, runs off into the storm drains, runs into the streets, and goes into the canals. We, we basically manage the canals. We open them up to drain the water so we don't have floods and, and, and loss of property and, and human lives. And so all that water gets flushed into Biscayne Bay. All those nutrients go into the bay. When you have high nutrients, you get algal blooms, these little tiny green guys that live in the water. So they bloom. And in the day, they, they basically, um, they, they grow very, very fast. And at, in the day, they photosynthesize. So that means they take CO2 and make oxygen. But at night, they respire. So when you get this huge algal biomass layers, at night, they suck up all the oxygen. Oxygen goes down to less than two milligrams per liter. And that's when the fish die. And so we've got this perfect storm. And what's more, basically Miami has grown faster than our infrastructure was built. So we have a whole series of, of, of small neighborhoods that are still on septic tanks. And, and many of you probably are on septic systems. I live in North Coral Gables and we have a septic system. When you get these big flood events, these big rainfall events, the septic system, basically the ground, gets saturated with water, and all of those nutrients from your house in your septic system get pushed up, pushed down into the groundwater, and they all make their way into Biscayne Bay, right? So everything now is connected to the bay. We're flushing lots and lots of nutrients, and Biscayne Bay is on the verge of what we call a tipping point. If we don't get, get control, of sort of our nutrients and our, our, our flooding, the way we manage our canal systems, and we keep pumping these nutrients into Biscayne Bay, the whole bay is, is going to die. I mean, it's basically going to become a eutrophic, um, high, covered with algae, virtually no organisms will live there, and it, it, it will become basically a, a not, not a good place. So, that's the, the story I'll start with, and I'll, I'll let Michael and, and Shahid um, talk about what, what some of the other issues are and what the, what the um, solutions are. But we are on the cusp of losing sort of our entire South Florida ecosystems, including our fresh water supply, if we don't get very, very aggressive about restoring the Everglades to get the fresh water volumes up to sort of fight uh, sea level rise, and if we don't get control of the nutrients coming from Okeechobee down and from the land um, going east. So thanks Great. very much. Mario, is that, is that good? Thanks. Yep, thank you, Professor Crowell. And of course, for the audience, we, we're talking here about long-term uh, environmental challenges. And we're also talking about the component of long-term environmental challenges is uh, increases in catastrophic events, wind, hurricane damage, uh, flooding uh, and things like that. And so while we're trying to manage the long-term processes that Professor Crowell has talked about, uh, we also have to pay attention to managing these increases in potential increases in catastrophic events. An important part of that is modeling those risks so that they can be priced in so that people know what risk they're running when they buy property so that they can get proper insurance and so forth. And that's where uh, Professor Hamid has done uh, very important work developing uh, the modeling for wind uh, hazard insurance on which insurance rates in the state of Florida are based. So Professor Hamid, uh, take it away, please. Is 
If you can unmute yourself. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> I'm the PI for the Florida Public Hurricane Loss Model, and this is based in the uh, Extreme Event Institute, um, the International Hurricane Research Center at the Extreme Event Institute. So let me give you start off by talking about the uh, uh, hazard that we face in terms of uh, hurricanes. So Florida ranks number one in the total property insured, uh, exposed to hurricane wind, and number two in coastal property exposed to storm surge. We have about $4 trillion in insured property, of which about $2.18 trillion are residential, and all are pretty much exposed to hurricane risk. So about 79% is coastal property, which is particularly vulnerable to hurricane risk. And of this, about 400 billion is also particularly vulnerable to storm surge. And it's important to note that about 35% of flood policies and 30% of the flood premium originate in the state of Florida in the whole you know, NFIP. Uh, Florida has about 6.1 million residential policies, homeowner policies, most of which covers uh, pretty much all, almost all cover wind insurance, but only 18% of homes in, uh, flood, uh, in Florida have flood insurance, which is a separate insurance. Uh, okay, so this is basically just a exposure that uh, different states have. So you can see that we're in the top three in terms of coastal counties, in along with New York and uh, and Texas. Um, so starting with Hurricane Andrew, 1992, uh, we've had a major crisis in personal and residential property insurance market. And it became particularly acute when we had multiple hurricanes in 2004 and 2005. And there's a lot of uncertainty about what the risk is and what the potential losses are, and, you know, for, and what do the insurance and the reinsurance industries are facing, for that matter, the real estate industry and banking industry are facing. Uh, rates have uh, increased dramatically, and that's had an adverse uh, impact on uh, several industries. Uh, for a 1990 built house, the average insurance premium increased about 680% uh, between uh, nine, in the 20 years between 1992 and 2012, and it's been going north since then. So starting in 2001, a multidisciplinary and multi-university team of professors and experts uh, developed what's called the Florida Public Hurricane Loss Model to assess a hurricane risk and expose potential. Now, we're not the only model. There are uh, private sector models like AER or risk management solutions and uh, uh, Aquacat and so on, uh, or core logic, et cetera, et cetera. But we are the uh, one that basically is transparent in the sense that we, we don't provide the, our uh, uh, code, uh, in bus, we, but we provide all the information, all the diagrams and uh, publications and so on. So we're pretty transparent as to what we're doing. Uh, so our model has been used over 1,300 times by the, by the Office of Insurance Regulation that regulates insurance uh, filings. And it's been used uh, 300 times by the state to conduct uh, uh, stress tests. Uh, actually, we do it on their behalf on about 60 to 70 insurance companies annually uh, to evaluate the solvency. And about 6 million uh, insured firms are impacted anytime a company like State Farm or any other company or like heritage insurance or universal property insurance and so on want to file for an increase or decrease in their rates. Uh, they provide us the input data about the exposure on individual properties and so on. We run it through our model. We provide the output to OER and they then use it to make decisions as to how much uh, changes in rates they'll allow. And we have also provided modeling service to about 30 firms in the insurance industry for fee. So we've been doing that for the last 10 years. And we go through extremely rigorous review process. There is a commission called the Florida Commission Hurricane Loss Projection Methodology that sets up standards that we have to meet and they certify us. Um, the universities that are involved, FIU is the leading university, but we also have, uh, for example, metrology department at Florida State is one of the top uh, in the country. So we have, I, I, I got experts from there to work on the project. So we have Florida State, University of Florida, uh, Florida Institute of Technology, NOAA, 
you know, see Miami, Notre Dame, and West Virginia, they're involved. So about 30 professors and experts, over 80 graduate and undergraduate students over the years have been involved in the development and operation. So, so the, what happened pre and Well, basically we had simple econometric models and we had actuarial models that looked at what happened in the previous 10 years or 20 years. And based on that, they projected losses. So if you didn't have any hurricane in the previous 10 years, your prediction was low. So for example, in 1992, these uh, models or econometric or simple actuarial models predicted that the losses would be 80 million dollars, $16 billion in insured losses of by Andrew. And when you use such models and you don't have hurricanes for a while and then suddenly you have hurricane, you're gonna have a huge spike in uh, premiums. And, and if there's no further hurricane for a while, it kind of declines. And then again, another hurricane hits and you have, so the traditional models don't work and they create wide swing in premiums. So there was a need for a multidisciplinary physical based computer model. So what does the model do? Well, it's a complex basically set of computer programs. It simulates, predicts how, where, and when hurricanes form, wind speed, their intensity, size, the track, how they are affected by terrain along the track, uh, how the wind interacts with different types of structures, how much they damage roofs, windows, doors, interiors, and how much of it will cost to rebuild the damaged part and how much will be paid by the insurance company. So its development requires experts in metrology, wind, structural engineering, statistics, coastal uh, the actuarial science, GIS, computer science, and so on. And for the flood part, also hydrologists and coastal engineers. And so what the model does is generate what we call annual average loss and probable maximum loss. And these are basically input into the rate making process. And we do that for building structures, content, additional living expenses, and, and so on. And uh, we also do scenario analysis. Okay, once we've ascertained the land falling hurricane track, size, speed, we can predict the losses they're likely to inflict down to the street level. And we can estimate losses reduction from different mitigation measures. Uh, so that, that gives us discounts. Uh, model can conduct stress tests on insurance company to assess solvency. In 2013, the state funded FIU to enhance the model by adding both storm surge and freshwater flooding components. And the enhancement, uh, we have come up with a prototype. It took us a while to develop it. It took longer than expected. Uh, flood models are way, way more complicated and require much more computational effort and so on. And the insurance industry has not, uh, you know, private insurance company insured flood since 1968, except through surplus lines. Uh, so basically, even uh, the federal government insures flood through the NFIP program, and it's quite heavily subsidized. And therefore, the NFIP is in the red, and it's you know difficult to project how long this can go on. Uh, so recently, the insurance and reinsurance industry showed some interest in insuring flood if premiums were actually real sound. And but what happened after Irma and Michael kind of slowed that down. Um, so it's becoming a, you know, pricing of flood insurance is, is really a political issue. It's, it's become a contentious issue, both at the state and federal level. And the model will basically estimate the risk and probable costs and determine what is sound actual pricing. But of course, you know, whether that can be actually applied is a different issue. And we're gonna follow the standards drafted by the commission. So these are, we have about 15 components making up the wind model. And uh, we, we did an extensive survey of the building stock in the state of Florida. We identified all the key features or combination of features that different houses have. And for uh, all the different com important combinations, we developed uh, engineering uh, damage models or vulnerability models. And we have about 10,000 of them. And these are 15 additional uh, components that are going to be, that have, have been added for flood modeling, flood loss, estimation and so on. Uh, so in case of, uh, we, we simulate about 57,000 years of, uh, um, of storms and roughly about 45,000 years occurring in 20,000 years. And, and no need to go into the detail of the model and so on, but uh, this is an example of what we generate. Uh, we have, uh, for example, the pro model probability that there'll be zero hurricane is 60%, one hurricane in, in Florida 
per year would be 20, but quarter 26%, two hurricanes in a year, 9.4, and something like what happened in 2004 uh, is a, you know, it's 2.8%, like one, once in a 35, 40 year event. Um, also important to note that uh, when you have winds at 100 uh, meters, uh, the winds at 100 meters, like the 28th floor, are about 50% greater than at, on the third floor. So if you have a cat one um, at the surface, you basically like to have cat uh, three on, uh, on the 10th floor. And if you have cat three on the surface, you're likely to have more like a cat five on the 10th floor. So high rise buildings are vulnerable. They have to be modeled separately, the condos and so on. The losses can increase exponentially with height. Um, so we have a person model for personal residential properties. We have a one or two story, and then we have low rise commercial residential, mid high rise commercial residential. And uh, as I said, there are about 10,000 vulnerability functions we have developed. And because the buildings are different, codes are different, we have basically, we take into account uh, building codes in different regions. And so we have weak, medium, strong uh, building, uh, vulnerability functions. And we take also into account law ordinance that I will talk about. So this is an example of uh, um, in central Florida in the windborne debris region, um, vulnerability for masonry building, uh, for different uh, uh, build, uh, strength of building construction. Uh, so this is basically relating damage to different wind speeds uh, for different quality of construction. And this is an example of uh, uh, a frame structure uh, and what happens when you apply different mitigation. For example, the, the top uh, curve on is basically without mitigation, the blue one. And then when you start adding hip roof, which is better than gable roof, uh, or you start adding shutters, these uh, cost curves, vulnerability curves rather, damage curves uh, are pushed down. And if you have a, a whole bunch combination of uh, these uh, mitigation features, it can go down to the red line. Um, Special case study um, mobile homes, they're especially vulnerable. Uh, before 1994, they didn't have to be tied down. There was a major change in the code, building code after 1994, where they had to be tied down and other mitigation features. And the one, uh, difference in vulnerabilities is dramatic. And we have kind of uh, verified this through post hurricane surveys of uh, uh, mobile home parks and so on. Um, this is basically. Uh, pictures of uh, some buildings you know, post hurricane, 2004-05 hurricane uh, near Melbourne. Um, they look, buildings look fine you know, from outside, but they had to be gutted because uh, wind, water damage uh, really basically made uh, this, these buildings uninhabitable. Uh, we, so we have basically have a, a, a flood, or rather storm surge flood model based on four basins. And these are examples of the um, maximum rather depth that are you know uh, that are predicted for these different basins. Uh, we also have six inland basins, uh, and we have uh, modeled them individually. And so, for example, we've taken into account all the streams, flow, lakes, and so on. Uh, all the control measures you have, dams and locks and everything. That it's it's really very difficult to model flooding um, if you, you know, from a catastrophe modeling point of view. It's very tedious, time consuming, and so on. You have to have all the rainfall taken into account, soil, everything. And uh, so, this is an example of uh, what the model produces. Uh, when you have in the Southeast region, when you have 28 inch rainfall, uh, 30 inch rainfall, 40 inch rainfall, what the water depth would be. And it's not as bad in the Southeast as it's uh, in the Northwest. So these are fragility curves for uh, flooding, um, what the damage would be at different depths uh, for different type of uh, storm surge, inland flood, moderate, uh, minor or moderate or severe storm surge and so on. And we have some selected output from the model. Um, the, our prediction on the average, the annual average loss zero deductible is 4.7 billion, net of deductible about 3 billion. So we did some scenario analysis. We took uh, hurricanes, same hurricane, exactly identical hurricane, and put them at four different locations uh, coming in uh, 90 degrees to the coast. And we estimated what the losses would be. So for, for example, in Jacksonville, a cat one, 
uh, 1.8 billion, uh, whereas net of what net of deductible loss for the insurance companies have to pay is 0.4. So essentially, the difference of 78 78 percent of the losses will have to be borne by homeowners, uh, you know, and they probably might need some federal help or FEMA help or something to make up for that when you have a CAT one. On the other hand, for the CAT five, we're talking about 16 billion uh, on zero deductible loss versus uh, 14 billion and difference is only 14%. Still that 14% represents substantial amount. And, and uh, in Miami, for instance, we're talking about uh, for CAT one, uh, between the, what the total damage is, losses versus what the insurance company pay, 55% for CAT one still has to be paid by homeowners through deduct, you know, because of deductibles, whereas uh, for CAT five, it's about 16. And um, the most vulnerable place, if you have a hurricane coming 90 degrees, is really Tampa. This uh, land falling hurricane Tampa will probably go through Orlando. Uh, we're talking about a 50 billion, and these are insured losses. And if you want to talk about total losses to infrastructure and economy multiplied by two to three times. And you will see that uh, there, you know, it's the same hurricane, but there are different wind speeds at different locations. 190 peak wind is 190 miles per hour for Cat 5, for example. If it's 190, we, um, we're talking about gust peace wind, you know, not the sustain. Uh, and it could be, it would be same hurricane will produce 165 in Panama City because of the differences in terrain and geography. Um, <clears throat> this is the mother of all hurricanes. So we, uh, the worst case scenario that we have come up with is basically a hurricane, a large uh, Cat 5 hurricane coming down from the south, slightly inland, going through uh, Dade County, uh, Broward County, Palm Beach County, all through the actually East Coast, bus soaring through the East Coast, slightly inland. So the, 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 you know, the real uh, damaging side is on the right, and it's, uh, and it's inland enough to also hit Orlando. We're talking about $147 billion in insured losses, the capacity in Florida is about 60 billion. So that's really the one in thousands of years scenario, uh, hopefully. Uh, when Irma, you know, came, uh, when Irma basically was predicted uh, to be CAT 5 with this sort of track, uh, it really freaked me out because, uh, you know, it looked like our worst case scenario. Uh, thankfully, it, uh, it uh, turned out to be, uh, you know, it shifted and it turned out to be uh, lesser intensity hurricane. Um, this is these are some of the estimates that we have uh, for damage reduction due to mitigation measures. So if you have hip roof, uh, these are the reductions for masonry versus frame. And it turns out that one of the best uh, mitigation uh, features that you can have to, to reduce the losses are really the nails, the type of nails you use. If you use AD nails, for example, it makes a tremendous difference. Uh, it can reduce losses and in, uh, strengthen roofs uh, substantially and it make a huge difference. And also the roof to wall connection, uh, if you use uh, straps instead of toenails or clips, makes a big difference, reduces losses. Uh, shutters and so on. Uh, bottom line is you can get up to 40% uh, uh, reduction in losses if you put in mitigation features. And there are some other mitigation features, technology that's being developed that's going to reduce this even further. The point is that insurance companies are not gonna give you discounts. They have to be basically brought in kicking and screaming and they need scientific proof or data that you know what reduction in losses are before they'll give you discount and this sort of study or modeling uh, provides that and the state of florida uses our model among others so and it you know mitigation matters because if you look at a three hundred thousand dollar home in miami uh, the median uh, uh, premium for a 1992 built home unmitigated is 13,500. This is based on a survey of 20 insurance companies, okay? If you mitigate that house with the features that I mentioned, the premium goes down to $6,500. And if, if the house is built under the 2004, five quote, we're talking about a $5,000. And this is just the median because there, so that means there are plenty of houses above that. So that's, there's a substantial, uh, you know, savings, uh, real savings in, in insurance, especially in Miami-Dade, and Robert, if you have these mitigation features. Um, flood insurance um, in low and moderate risk zone is very cheap. It's a great deal. And yet only 18% have flood insurance. So the NFIP residential policy covers a building up to 250,000, content up to 100,000. Uh, commercial policies are limited to 500,000 for building. 
And if you want coverage above the limit, you have to go to the surplus line, like Lloyd's of London, which are unregulated and can charge a lot more. And the same is true for flood policies in high risk zone. Um, Hurricane Harvey in Houston showed that even low risk area can get 50 inch of rainfall and 120, uh, excuse me, let me uh, just check something. Yeah. So you can get, uh, can you hear me by the way? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. okay. So Hurricane Harvey in Houston showed that even low risk areas can get 50 inches of rainfall and 120 billion dollar tons of water dumped down. So there's really no zero risk zone in Florida and flood claims tend to be larger than wind claims. So flood maps used by FEMA are outdated, need to be replaced. For long-term viability of um, the flood insurance program, you have to allow eventually the insurance companies to insure flood and the rates will have to increase. That's inevitable, okay? When that happens, the only way to keep rates affordable is to develop inexpensive mitigation technology for flood, flooding. And a lot is happening in that, uh, in that area. Um, so here are some of the issues that uh, legal issues that we have to address in modeling, law and ordinance. We model law and or ordinance in our vulnerability model. Insurance companies are required to pro provide LNO coverage. So for example, if there is, if houses, uh, if a house is more than X percent damage at 50%, it must be demolished and built uh, not up to the current code. So not only you have to rebuild the whole house, but you have to build it up to a more expensive current code. So if more than, for example, 50% of windows are damaged, then all the windows must be replaced and brought up to code. So that increases repair cost. And of course there's demolition costs involved. Another issue that uh, is big is really flood versus wind uh, loss. In Florida, over 98% of homes uh, have wind insurance, but only 18% have flood. So it's often difficult to separate wind damage uh, from flood damage for the same event. And water damage, for example, from infiltration through uh, roof dam uh, damage roof and windows or garage doors is covered by wind policy, but damage from rising water is not. That For that, you have to flood policy. So many uh, homeowners without flood policy try to claim water uh, uh, loss through uh, wind policy. And that results in thousands of lawsuits, which is what happened when uh, I have colleagues, uh, engineers who have testified in lawsuits and made half a million dollar or more in consulting fee. Um, we have, uh, so, so to speak, the dominant versus concurrent uh, legal philosophy that's uh, fighting it, you know, that's being fought on. In 2016, the Florida Supreme Court ruled that when it is not possible to establish which hazard caused damage first, the concurrent cause applied. So even if uh, wind was not the major cause, as long as it contributed to the, you know, the entire loss may be covered by the wind policy. So insurance companies have started inserting what is called the anti-concurrent provision in their policies, and there are more lawsuits. Uh, so one of the objectives of our model is to sort of provide better modeling of the relative role of wind versus um, damage. Uh, we'll try to use our wind combined model to separate, you know, for any given event, the flood versus wind losses. It's not an easy thing to do. I mean, typically a lot of the adjusters simply draw a line around the wall and say anything below that is flood, above that is uh, wind damage, but we're trying to come up with a better protocol. Another issue is assignment of benefit, allows policyholders to give permission to contractors and adjusters to build insurance companies, settle claims directly. It's, uh, it's like contractors are now the policyholders can create abuse and it does, uh, unnecessary repairs and so on, resulting in insurance crisis. Uh, it has led to higher premiums, a lot of lawsuits, and that's something very, very difficult to model. We were asked to do it, but we can't. Um, lessons from the past hurricane. The part of the house that's really most vulnerable to hurricane wind is the roof and roof to wall connection. Uh, much improvement in the building code and roof design connection, but still very vulnerable to major hurricanes. The bottom line is that wood, uh, wood roofs are not suitable for hurricane-prone area. We need to switch to concrete roof. I mean, wooden roof, uh, you know, slope roof with barrel tides on them are architecturally appealing, and uh, you know, and uh, uh, the uh, construction industry loves them, uh, and uh, homeowners love to have them. But it's really, really uh, contributing to the big losses that we're getting. Now, engineers at FIU have patented. For example, 
a one and a half inch thick lightweight uh, but strong concrete roof and with waves in them you know that can uh, stand up to 200 uh, miles per hour it's cheap to build installed they can be sloped with waves to look like barrel pipes painted like them and make them architecturally more appealing uh, and also because of the wave you have more wind uh, load bearing the problem is to sell that concept it's not easy to market it the builders haven't really caught on and but in the future that's really the way to go we'll have to really switch to concrete roofs it can make a huge difference i mean we have tested in our wall of wind um, uh, up to 250 miles per hour it can stand up to 250 miles per hour uh, so in the 1990s when i was looking for a house to buy they were offering for a new newly constructed house uh, a safe room with concrete a slab on top and so on and and walls uh, for five thousand dollar more, if you had newly built house, I, I, I kind of bought an existing older house, and uh, you know, this um, <clears throat> there were hardly any buyers. People are not willing to put up even five thousand dollars to put in the to have the safe roof. But anyway, it, it's really in the long run. Basically, we have to kind of move on to safe rooms, and we have to move on to uh, you know uh, concrete roof. Um, one of the things we don't do in our model is uh, sea level rise model sea level rise and model uh, uh, climate change. Because uh, insurance premiums are determined by uh, what's going on currently. It's, you know, it's a one year policy, uh, every year it's renewed. And so we can't be using predictions of uh, what's gonna happen 10 years from now in uh, pricing today. Uh, but it's an important issue. I'd like to do it to get the funding. Uh, I occasionally go to the, because um, my project is funded by the state of Florida. And so I go and uh, uh, testify in front of the appropriation committee and so on. And one of the questions I used to get was, are you modeling sea level rise? And I would say no. And, and so the chair of the committee said, good, don't waste any taxpayers' money. I think that attitude has changed now. Uh, I think there is, a, and I've seen politically, there is a movement for uh, in, incorporating uh, components about sea level rise eventually in our model, and hopefully we'll get funding to do so. Um, and that's basically it. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, so, uh, Mike, uh, you have a lot of experience uh, with FEMA, among other things, and the uh, flood risk management program. Uh, you know, as we've seen, the panelists, we've seen, we have a lot of uh, long-term challenges in South Florida. We've got challenges from potential catastrophic events. Uh, in the federal government, they've been, we've, the federal government's been trying to keep up with all of this, developing a framework uh, for disaster management and hazard mitigation. Uh, it would be great to hear uh, Mike talk a little bit about the history of that program and how it's structured uh, and potential reforms. Um, again, as, as Professor uh, Hamid mentioned, um, a lot of these problems are political. And so these policies really test uh, the willingness and, and ability of communities to absorb the costs of mitigation as things are as as actual risks are priced more accurately and understood more accurately. Uh, so, with that in mind, uh, Mike, take it away. Uh, thank you, Mario. Uh, let me get my uh, screen shared here. All right, uh, hopefully you can see that. Uh, so um, just a, a little bit about um, myself. I, uh, Mario and I were colleagues um, a, a couple of years ago at uh, the Council on Environmental Quality, which is a small federal agency. It's part of the uh, executive office of the president and the White House. Um, the uh, I moved over uh, to uh, WSP, which is a um, large engineering and, and professional services firm uh, this summer. And uh, WSP uh, focuses on, well, you know, all manner of, of infrastructure in the built environment. Uh, and I work particularly on the environmental uh, permitting process for uh, the kind of federal interface to so work with federal agencies and with project sponsors that have projects uh, before the federal government. Um, but as, as Mario mentioned, I, I did spend some time at FEMA, so prior to joining uh, the Council on Environmental Quality, and actually when I first joined CEQ, uh, I was on detail from uh, Federal Emergency Management Agency. 
Um, and FEMA's missions are broken out into kind of five primary areas, uh, preventions, uh, which, which focuses on threats. You, if you get into some of the FEMA uh, doctrine, um, you, you will see discussion of both uh, you know, threats and hazards, uh, threats being more of the um, man-made uh, risks and, and hazards being the environmental ones. Uh, and then protection, uh, they have a, you know, there's a hurricane preparedness uh, week or month every year at the beginning of hurricane season that, that you all down in Florida, I'm sure are well aware of, um, and uh, the types of things that uh, everyone can do to uh, ensure that they are prepared uh, for a potential disaster event. Uh, mitigation, which I'm going to focus on uh, primarily today uh, with the discussion of some of FEMA's programs uh, and actually the flood insurance program is part of their mitigation um, uh, directorate. Uh, response activities. So in the immediate aftermath of a natural disaster, uh, FEMA has, you know, kind of urban search and rescue and other support that can be provided. Uh, you'll often see in advance of, um, of a major hurricane uh, or uh, any landfalling hurricane, uh, an emergency declaration. Uh, so there are there are two types of declarations that come that can um, activate FEMA resources, uh, both of which are um, issued by the President of the United States. One is an emergency declaration, which frees up uh, certain resources for uh, the kind of uh, you know staging of uh, supplies and equipment in advance uh, of a uh, of an event and in the immediate aftermath of an event, and then the major disaster declaration, which that comes uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, certainly at least days, but oftentimes weeks or maybe even months after a uh, disaster. Um, and the way that, uh, that that is authorized is that the, the state uh, or federally recognized tribe uh, would apply to FEMA. Uh, FEMA uh, comes up with a recommendation after having looked at uh, some preliminary damage assessments. Uh, you have to meet certain criteria uh, in terms of losses uh, at, at the county level. And then the designation is done at the, at the county level. And it, that can free up resources both on the um, individual assistance side, uh, so for uh, for people that are displaced uh, from from the hurricane or have lost their homes, uh, as well as um, for kind of publicly owned uh, infrastructure. So those are the two primary areas where FEMA um, FEMA assistance uh, is is seen after a disaster. Uh, and you can have one or the other or both, depending on the nature of the, of the disaster uh, and the types of impacts that were seen. Uh, and so FEMA will come up with a recommendation on whether the president should um, approve or deny uh, the request for a major disaster declaration. Uh, and that'll go up through the National Security Council staff um, that are part of the White House. Uh, and they will make a recommendation um, kind of on top of, of FEMA's and then the president will will approve or, or deny. So I'd say that the recovery side of FEMA is, is certainly in terms of dollar amount and um, kind of public interface and, and the state and local uh, and tribal interface is the largest program uh, that FEMA operates. And, and when you see the big catastrophic events, that's where you have uh, kind of the most uh, funding that's activated. Uh, and when it is, it's often done, you know, with a cost share. Sometimes that can be waived, but essentially, you know, the federal government is picking up, you know, 80% of the costs and the, and the states and localities uh, or tribes will be picking up 20% you know, and then at the discretion of the agency and, and ultimately the president, um, the uh, cost share can be lowered uh, or waived. So focusing in on that mitigation square uh, from the last slide, uh, here is um, the kind of key programs that I'm going to speak on today. First is the National Flood Insurance Program, and then second will be the Hazard Mitigation Assistance Program and a bunch of, sort of sub variants uh, uh, to that program. Um, both or all of, all of what you see on this screen is housed within FIMA. Uh, so you have FEMA and FIMA. Um, they are uh, the, two, the, the this is kind of the the sub entity within FEMA that focuses on mitigation. Um, and this was the 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 office that I sat in uh, when I was at FEMA. And it also houses the kind of environmental uh, program that serves the entire agency, looking at the uh, the potential environmental effects of federal actions. So for every you know dollar that FEMA spends that has to go through a federal environmental review, um, that office within FEMA. Um, 
will uh, conduct the um, compliance and, and approval uh, of those actions. So, uh, you know, first, I'm going to speak about some of the aspects of um, the NFIP program, and then I will go into uh, the hazard mitigation assistance program. Uh, but just as a general overview, those kind of five squares that you see uh, below um, below the HMG or the hazard mitigation assistance program are the various types of mitigation uh, funding that FEMA provides. So what I just discussed uh, kind of have the recovery dollars flow uh, after a disaster where, you know, there is a damage assessment that's prepared and then uh, if it meets a certain threshold and goes and is approved by the president, uh, then uh, the, that funding will flow to the community uh, with, the, with the cost share provision. Um, hazard mitigation would come in uh, at the end of the process, or uh, for the pre-disaster mitigation, um, would come in uh, prior to um, the funding. So, but first, let's turn to uh, the NFIP program. So, uh, the elements of this program, I mean, there are. Um, it, it, it gets rather complex, uh, as uh, I think our um, previous presentation by Professor Hamid. Uh, indicated, uh, you know, insurance programs generally uh, are very complex and um, and when you have the federal government involved, uh, all the more so. Um, and really the reason why uh, the federal government is in this role uh, is that um, generally uh, the, the private sector was was not interested or the pricing got uh, was too high um, for for that. So in some ways, the federal government is kind of the insurer of last resort. But as uh, Professor Amid mentioned, um, there is some subsidization that goes on. And so that um, provides, you know, some uh, uh, distortions uh, to uh, what you would see in a normal insurance market. But I think in some ways, what we've seen in the political process, uh, mainly in, in Congress with uh, the um, reauthorization of, uh, or the reauthorization kind of process associated with the flood insurance program uh, is that it, it is a difficult uh, political question uh, because, uh, you know, congressional representatives that are uh, home to um, flood prone areas, areas, homes that are in what are called special flood hazard areas, uh, they, um, their constituents uh, would likely um, be, you know, the would burden would be you know, burdened by the increase and to get up to a kind of a full actuarial risk uh, premium um, would be uh, very unpopular. So there is um, a, a push and pull. Um, starting here at the top, the hazard identification and, and mapping process. So the flood insurance program is based on what are referred to as uh, flood insurance rate maps uh, or firms. Um, and this maps both the coastal areas as well as uh, riverine flooding uh, potential. Um, and when you look at, um, you know, a flood insurance risk map, uh, you see that there are, uh, everything's broken out into various zones. Um, and uh, those zones um, include what I mentioned earlier, the special flood hazard area. That is the one that has kind of the highest likelihood. Um, and within that, you will see uh, areas that are in what is known as kind of the base flood elevation, uh, the area that is um, kind of, um, I think, uh, commonly referred to as the 100-year floodplain. Uh, and what that really means is uh, it is an area that is, you know, based on the, the modeling um, that was done to, to develop the map, uh, it was the area that was shown to have a 1% risk of a flood uh, in any given year. And so um, there, that is one, one of the zones. There are other zones that are in the, what is referred to commonly as the 500 year flood plain, which is a 0.2% chance in any given year. Uh, and then um, variations from that and, and then special uh, floodways where, you know, water tends to flow and expand if you do have, you know, a, a river that's feeding into um, a, a larger body of water and you get uh, inundation there, it's going to go up and kind of expand from that and you'll have um, different different factors uh, at risk there. Also, uh, another nuance is, you know, if you are right on the coast, uh, if, if storm surge is going to impact you, not just, um, be, you know, 
not just storm surge, but actual wave action, then there's a special, you know, we're, we're essentially there's a velocity factor where this way water is not just kind of slowly moving in, but you're actually um, being potentially, you know, battered uh, by by waves, and that obviously would increase uh, risk if that was the situation. So that all of that information is carry is is in a flood insurance rate map. Um, those uh, are also available through a GIS viewer. So if you Google National Flood Hazard Layer, uh, you will find uh, kind of an ArcGIS uh, platform online where you can punch in an address and you can see the details of that. Um, the actual uh, flood insurance rate maps um, are kind of printouts that that um, show you know various um, data and, and kind of look like something you'd see at like a county assessor's office or whatnot. Um, and yeah, that is um, the, as, as was mentioned earlier, uh, one other point on this, uh, there are areas uh, that are unmapped um, and the, um, the, the kind of in part because of the you know resource constraints, you know the FEMA uh, is uh, subject to the whims of Congress uh, in terms of funding, as are all federal agencies. So, um, if there uh, if funding is not made available uh, to update rate maps, uh, then rate maps are not updated. Uh, and so there is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, kind of this push and pull around reauthorization of the National Flood Insurance Program. Um, it actually it actually lapsed, um, I believe it was a year ago um, for a period of time, um, it was not reauthorized. And there was a big question was whether that would be you know, a, a problem. Ultimately, when it was reauthorized subsequent to the lapse, uh, they the there was language put into that reauthorization, or actually it was just an extension. It wasn't a complete authorization, um, and it, it extended it only through September of 2021. So we're going to come up on another um, NFIP reauthorization um, fight here in the next year. Uh, but what what they did was they they basically said that you know everything would be honored that occurred during the lapse. So uh, it was functionally as though it didn't happen, but during that period of time, uh, certainly there were open questions as to what would happen with policies. Um, going down our list here, um, floodplain management standards for participating communities. So if, uh, so, you know, not everyone uh, in the country actually uh, can purchase uh, flood insurance from the federal government. And that's because uh, the community that the, that the, um, that the, individual lives in has to participate in the flood insurance program in order for that individual to be able to buy flood insurance from the federal government. And in order to be authorized as a participating community by FEMA, you need to meet certain minimum standards. Um, and uh, those would involve, you know, requiring permits for development in the special flood hazard area. So if you, you know, if you have unbuilt land in this, you know, what is essentially identified as a high risk for flood hazard, uh, then you need some permitting uh, program in place so that you can ensure that, you know, some of those mitigation elements that were discussed uh, by Professor Hamid, uh, as they apply to, to floods, not necessarily wind, uh, would be required uh, for, for, the, for building in that area, uh, specifically, um, you know, all new residential buildings in a special flood hazard area would need to be um, at or above the base flood elevation. Uh, so mentioned above, whatever is identified is that risk of one in one percent annual risk of a flood up to that level. You have to build the the home at that level. So theoretically, if you have that one in one hundred year flood, uh, that home that is newly permitted and new residential build would not uh, be impacted uh, by that. Um, and that is, uh, sometimes the base flood elevation is not always accurate. Uh, so as you know, as, as science uh, is, is evolving and, and environmental trends around climate change are changing, um, the, um, the risk model that was used originally may, may not be accurate. So um, that's always a, a, an additional variable and a little bit more on that later. Um, there is also the you know, community would have to restrict development in uh, what are floodways. So what I mentioned earlier, where you've, you've got a, kind of a riverine area that this area is going to flood with kind of moving water, um, there there can't be development in that area. Um, and uh, certain construction methods and materials uh, would also be required. Um, that said, a community can go above and beyond that with the community rating system. And so what you would do there would be you would in you would uh, require, the community would, would require um, more 
uh, in the way of uh, building standards uh, to mitigate uh, flooding, perhaps the elevation is higher than the base flood elevation. It's the base flood elevation plus an additional foot of freeboard uh, or more. Um, anything in that uh, area that a community opts in to do what it can actually lower the premiums for the um, residential homes and uh, other properties that are eligible for national flood insurance program uh, policies uh, would actually lower their premiums. So that's certainly something that uh, local communities and, and could even happen uh, at the statewide level uh, if a state is a participant in the program. Um, because uh, there are these requirements of the minimum standards, um, a community can be suspended uh, from the program if they um, uh, fail to adopt and approve um, the certain floodplain maps uh, or fail to uh, put management standards in place um, in the time periods required under FEMA's regulations. Um, and also if they were to repeal uh, previous, uh, previously adopted standards uh, or set their standards below the minimum requirements, uh, then the community would be suspended uh, from the program uh, and, and that would affect all the policies of the homeowners uh, in that area. Um, there's also, uh, in, in, so moving down into premiums uh, coverage and then NFIP debt. Um, so uh, the premiums are based on risk and actuarial principles, uh, but as um, you know, Professor Amid discussed uh, some of that actuarial uh, science. If it's not, you know, it depends on the, the the time bound you have, and and that there are, um, you know, if you don't have that event for 30, 50, 75 years, then uh, the risk uh, looks lower uh, than it actually may be. So um, that is an area that I am certainly not an expert in, um, and but I think it's generally the case that um, the in addition to actual subsidies where they're actually they're finding their what the rate should be based on FEMA's process of, of risk and, and actuarial principles they are then they're discounting it further for some properties and in particular it is properties uh, where their uh, the property was constructed or substantially improved prior to uh, December 31st 1974 or before the date upon which FEMA published the first firm for that area. So if FEMA didn't get around to mapping your community until 1980, then, and your home was built in 1979, you will have a subsidized rate, uh, depending on uh, where your property is. So um, that's certainly uh, one area where, you know, it's, it's known that we're not charging uh, the full uh, actuarial rate for the risk. Uh, but then that does not include kind of the further compounding effect of the risk may be understated to begin with, given, um, you know, the actual uh, frequency of storms and flooding, uh, which, you know, as we saw with, with Harvey and some of these other storms, you know, there were in areas that uh, are not in, um, you know, flood zones, places where the community members would not otherwise uh, be required to have insurance, because there are certain, there are requirements around insurance for federally funded mortgages and, and so on. Uh, so, um, the uh, the fact that we saw massive amounts of losses in Louisiana and, and Texas in recent years for areas that are not required to have flood insurance uh, for their um, uh, homes is is problematic and indicates uh, a problem with some of the um, risk models that are used in uh, the development of the flood risk maps. Um, the oh, Mike, can we so yeah. we, to, to leave time for as much time as possible for questions? Uh huh. Um, can you? Uh, maybe wrap up in a minute or so. Uh, yes, I, I got a couple more slides, um, but I will um, I will get a move on. So uh, to wrap up on this, as Professor Hamid mentioned, the the premium coverage is two hundred fifty thousand uh, for the structure, one hundred thousand for the contents. Um, the program, NFIP program, um, in addition to the premiums that it receives, uh, is, is authorized to um, be indebted to the U.S. Treasury uh, to the tune of $30 billion. Um, they actually were essentially at that cap when Hervey, Ar uh, Irma, and Maria um, happened, uh, and uh, Congress waived, uh, 60, absolved the NFIP program of $16 billion in debt so that they had spare capacity, but then since then, and they've worked back up to approximately uh, 20 billion in debt with, with about 9 billion remaining. Um, so that is the overview on the NFIP program. 
Um, this is a slide covers um, the resilience and mitigation funding. So uh, after a disaster occurs, uh, a community is eligible for hazard mitigation funds from the hazard mitigation grant program. Uh, and this is a formula funding. So they take, you know, how much disaster assistance did the community receive? Uh, then you get a percentage of that. So the fir for the first $2 billion, you'll get 15% of that in hazard mitigation assistance. And then beyond that, it's 10 for the next 8 billion and, and above that um, up to 35, it's seven and a half percent. So just to give you a frame of reference, New York state received approximately 14 billion uh, in, for Hurricane Sandy. So, you know, a big catastrophic event like that uh, would generate, you know, approximately uh, $2 billion or so in, um, in hazard mitigation grants that then can be uh, spent on elevating properties, acquiring properties. If you've got some where you just say, we're not, we should not be in this area at all, uh, you can buy them out. Uh, and then other mitigation projects that could be geared at, you know, certain infrastructure that uh, the, the state or county owns um, in that area. There is also a requirement for uh, co local cost share. So the, the state or the county has to come up with 25% of the costs. And that actually leads to some states that have unspent mitigation dollars where they've received it, but because of budget shortfalls in the state and they're funding you know, schools and, and other requirements, um, they, uh, it's not a priority necessarily, even though the federal government is uh, sitting there with 75 cents on the dollar uh, to spend on those projects. Uh, uh, the newest program that was just authorized uh, under the Disaster Recovery Reform Act, uh, which passed in, I believe, 2018, um, is the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities. And this is a, um, the first round of funding uh, is actually open currently. Uh, so uh, communities uh, would apply up through uh, the state uh, for uh, competitive grant funds. So the state ultimately submits the application to FEMA, but localities, cities, and, and other local subdivisions uh, can apply and, and, and put their application up through the state. It's $500 million. It's gonna be based on essentially a percentage of the funds for all disasters in the previous year or two. I forget exactly the time window that it looks back to, to formulate how much funding is available. Uh, but it's similar types of projects, uh, mitigation and, and other capacity building aspects and also uh, includes a cost share. And then um, next up, uh, this is, I wanted to touch on the national disaster recovery framework. So when you have a big catastrophic event, it is not just FEMA that, that uh, kind of needs to be part of the recovery process. And uh, this framework itself is a national framework. It's not a federal framework. So it involves states, localities, tribes, and the federal government in uh, oh, it's no, like a whole of government uh, response to uh, help the community recover. Oftentimes long-term recovery uh, drags on for, you know, certainly years, often, you know, a decade or more for big catastrophic events. Um, there are, uh, there's a federal body called the Recovery uh, Support Function Leadership Group, which has uh, six uh, recovery support functions, um, community planning and capacity building, economic, health and social services, housing, infrastructure, and natural and cultural resources. Each of those is chaired by a different federal agency. So you have the Army Corps of Engineers for infrastructure, you have housing and urban development for housing, and they bring special expertise uh, to the local community level. Uh, so they will deploy folks uh, from their home office out into the uh, field. They'll work out of the joint uh, field office that FEMA sets up for that recovery and they can help uh, support and develop the support the state and the localities which develop their uh, kind of disaster recovery uh, work plan uh, that that identifies uh, how funds will be spent and um, let's see I think this is my last slide I just wanted to touch on another element of federal policy in the flood space which is flood risk management standards. Uh, so in 1978, there was executive order 11988, uh, which established a process for any federally funded or federally authorized actions that occur in the floodplain. And when, when it speaks of the floodplain, it is talking about what is referred to as the base flood elevation, or essentially that area that's co commonly referred to as the 100-year floodplain. Um, for critical infrastructure, it uses the 500-year floodplain, uh, which is the 0.2% risk uh, in any given year. This was 
updated in, um, well, first a, a small uh, word on the process, uh, essentially it requires the federal agency to look at, are there alternatives to putting this project in uh, the floodplain? And if there are, and those are feasible, then that should be pursued. Uh, if there are not feasible alternatives, then look at ways that you can mitigate uh, the risk, either through elevation, or if that's not possible, some sort of flood proofing uh, or, or something uh, along those lines. It does not prohibit development in the floodplain, uh, but it encourages it and uh, it to not be built there and uh, for uh, mitigation to be implemented. Uh, in 2015, uh, Executive Order 13690 was passed, which established a federal flood risk management standard that was essentially more protective. It took the same program uh, from the 1978 regs, but for federally funded activities, not federally authorized, but for the federally funded activities, it increased the protective standard. Uh, and it said it is the 100 year floodplain plus two feet of freeboard. Uh, or it is the 500 year floodplain or a climate informed science approach. Uh, so that would mainly be for kind of coastal areas as opposed to riverine, uh, but it, it gave the agency a choice of which to apply for any given project. That was subsequently uh, rescinded um, in August of 2017 on, with executive order uh, 13807 is actually rescinded, I believe, a, a week prior to Hurricane Harvey, uh, which uh, certainly drew some some criticism uh, given the timing uh, of that. But uh, I think important to know because this space is uh, another area where the federal government, you know, outside of the National Flood Insurance Program, uh, you know, has a uh, a role in um, establishing uh, some sort of uh, protective, uh, you know, um, fiscally responsible uh, use of federal dollars in um, in areas where there's a likelihood of loss. And uh, that's all. So hopefully, Mario, we still have plenty of time uh, for um, for questions. I will stop sharing my screen and we can get to that. So thank you, Mike. Uh, we've got, uh, so the, me the meeting actually ends uh, formally at 11, but I think we, we can go over maybe 10 minutes. Um, and it, I would like to ask a question, but in the meantime, I would like to open it up to Q&A. At the bottom of your screen, uh, there's a Q&A button. If you'd like to ask a question, uh, please do so now, and I will read your question to the panelists. Um, I'll start with a question uh, for Mike. Uh, we saw in uh, Hurricane Harvey that, uh, that the and in the response, in the FEMA response to Hurricane Harvey, that the that low-income communities were particularly devastated and particularly left kind of uh, high and dry, uh, or rather hanging in the flood, I guess you would say. Um, uh, and, and that really revealed significant gaps in this in the entire framework. Um, how would you describe the arc of reforms over the past several years in the direction that we're heading in? Uh, uh, in terms of in terms of protecting those most vulnerable communities, obviously, a more adaptive framework that reduces risk to life and limb as well as risk to property uh, will need a more market a more market rational uh, valuation of the actual risks involved. Uh, but that, in in turn, is going to really increase the pressure on homeowners and particularly on ones in low income areas. So how has the federal framework been evolving uh, to help protect those vulnerable communities? Yeah, a uh, great question, Mario. Uh, and I think really to, you know, get to a the proper policy solution, you know, we have to look historically at, at why why were those communities, why were low-income communities, uh, you know, more adversely affected by a flooding event? And, uh, you know, my understanding and, and, and views on it are that the, you know, the, the land that was located in the floodplains, the most likely to flood, uh, it was, was uh, relatively inexpensive and also uh, in, could, involves a lot of risk, as we've seen. Uh, so, the, you know, home developers found, you know, uh, were, were able to develop in that area, which was a, you know, policy decision to, to not restrict it uh, at, at, at some point in the past. And uh, because of the heightened risk uh, or the, you know, the lower costs of living in that area, um, it happens to be an area where um, you have a higher uh, percentage of low income residents. 
so what do you what do we do prospectively? Uh, how do we solve that problem? Um, you know, either pre disaster or post disaster when when funds are available i think is the most um it's the time when there's the most opportunity to act uh, because often it is a question of funding and so uh relocation or elevation is a possibility but obviously elevation is um you know depends on the building type and it, it is expensive uh and you know i know when I, I was in houston following a flooding event in 2015 and uh the you know a lot of the homes that were damaged there uh were um slab on grade construction which are not you cannot elevate those uh, it's, it's not feasible uh and under the national, even if they're insured under the national flood insurance program, if the damage assessment is more than 50% of the structure's value, then you get the policy, um, you know, you get the, the, the payment from the insurance, uh, but you cannot rebuild. Uh, you you without elevating above um, the floodplain. So uh, it is a it is an issue and it's one it's an expensive one and I think it's certainly one that you know you need the local community buy in uh, because the community ultimately kind of needs to be in the driver's seat around you know what their vision is and then take that and leverage those federal dollars and my encouragement would be for communities to do that thinking well ahead of the disaster, you know, kind of know where are your vulnerable areas that you have these questions about buyouts or elevations and then make that plan so that when it happens, you can move relatively quickly uh, to pursue those actions. Uh, there's also gonna need to be, you know, socialization of these ideas within the community and, and getting that buy-in because oftentimes, you know, it's uh, not uh, the, in intent of the you know those who live there to um to have to leave so uh it's it, it is a tough question um, but one that has you know historical antecedents that have gotten us here great thank you mike and i so i have a question we have a question from lauren ramos and uh i think it would be great uh professor hamid if you can uh weigh in on this one uh with sea level rise and the heightened risk of catastrophic events Thinking specifically about new development, at what point might construction lenders and insurance companies stop lending and insuring? I would imagine that those companies would realize that lending or insuring for 50 years might not be feasible if certain portions of the new development yeah. may be underwater. And I would add to that that we already see that, right? I mean, the very fact that yeah. uh, flood insurance only covers uh, $250,000 of the value of a home, I think I just, clo I just moved into a house in Surfside uh, where I was rudely greeted by one of my neighbors, namely climate change in the form of flooding, uh, uh, the catastrophic, not catastrophic flooding, but very bad flooding last weekend. Uh, how, do we, uh, how, how do we think about that? Well, it really hasn't affected the industry yet, the lending industry uh, and the real estate industry, you know. But I was in a panel discussion in, you know, with uh, one of the prominent builders in Miami, and he basically said that he had a window of 30 years. That means in 30 years, he's gonna sell his portfolio, get out of Miami, uh, unless things change. So, and he kind of uh, explained, you know, I, I don't remember all the justification, but that was his window. And he must have done a, you know, real good analysis of, uh, of the timeline. And what's happened, for example, there are studies that have shown that uh, the real estate market is being affected to some degree. So in Miami Beach, around that area, they looked around the coast and they took uh, the same houses, similar houses, except that one was more vulnerable to sell a level rise than other. You know, there's some variations in in uh, in, in the height and so on, elevation. And so based on where these houses were located, they were pretty much along the coast, but uh, and found that the uh, property values have gone down in the last few years by 7% for the houses that were uh, more vulnerable to sea level rise. Um, but uh, the rent had not, th there was no decline in rent, difference in rental. And, and rents are based on basically what's happening right now. You pay your rent for this year, but the property values are basically capitalization of all future rents and future cash flows and so on. And so it's clear that the market is uh, taking into account uh, sea level rise to some degree uh, we have some evidence of that already, that property values have gone down, but not uh, huge amount. Mar Mario, let me just add, I was on a panel recently with the Miami Chamber of Commerce, and some of the major developers basically admitted that there's a complete disconnect between long-term environmental change 
and sort of building and, and, and financial capital recovery. So most of these folks get their money back within six years. And so the fact that everything could be, be flooded 10, 15, 20 years, they don't care. They're in and out and they've got their money back. So, you know, there's a complete disconnect there between what's actually happening down the road and how people invest their money. Yeah. And I just went through that, uh, getting my first mortgage to buy this house that the uh, U.S. Senate Federal Credit Union, uh, which was the which did my mortgage, I think only had my mortgage for a couple of days before it packaged it and moved it on to somebody else. So um, the, the time horizon for all of these investments and development is, is one that's not really, doesn't seem to be really taking into account some of these long, longer term risks. And that's something that I think really um, requires a more, a more finely tuned regulatory framework to bring to bear. Uh, Professor Kral, we have a, a, uh, a question from Enrique, Professor Villamor. Enrique Villamor is of the mathematics department, the deputy director of the environmental finance program. Uh, so this is for Professor Kral. Who's funding the Everglades Restoration Project? And has anyone thought about financing the restoration of at least part of it using innovative financial instruments that would be attractive to private financial investors? So the simple answer is all of us are funding it. It's taxpayer money, right? I mean, Department of Interior, USGS, Army Corps of Engineers, and their budgets come from federal taxes, right? So, uh, and I think actually, Mario, I'm going to kick this over to you, and maybe Enrique wants to speak as well. This is a good opportunity to pitch our newly, you know, launched environmental finance and risk management program, because that's exactly what that's meant, meant to do, is to get people to invest in the environment for the long-term health, wealth, and happiness of, of what, we, what, we, what we depend on, things like Biscayne Bay and the Everglades. But Mario, maybe this is a good opportunity to talk about your and Enrique's new thing. Great, thank you. Uh, so uh, just for everyone on the program, this is, I'm actually pleased to say this is the first, um, this is the first of what will hopefully be many events uh, sponsored and co-sponsored by uh, the Environmental Finance and Risk Management Program. Uh, uh, which is a program of the Institute of Environment, but it's a uh, interdisciplinary program. The, the vision of the program is to bring together the university's best minds in mathematics and financial modeling with people on the environment side from the Institute of Environment and in the environmental sciences and the College of Law uh, on the law and policy side um, we I look at it as a sort of, I see a sort of pyramid where at the base level we have, uh, we're going to try to put together a, this interdisciplinary research program so that graduate students in environmental science can be exposed to uh, base, the basics of financial modeling and also to the basics of law and policy, like the regulatory frameworks that Mike Drummond just uh, did a survey of. Uh, and so that they can be more effective when they go out into the workforce. We've seen in my time in government that the more a, uh, an engineer, say, or a lawyer progresses through, uh, through, through a career in government uh, and gets closer and closer to policymaking levels, the more being effective in that policymaking level requires a, a really interdisciplinary understanding of, the ver of these various components. So, what we're trying to do is develop cutting edge research and then uh, at the same time be able to prepare students for uh, these policy making roles. Uh, the Environmental Finance and Risk Management Program uh, is going to be doing a lot of stakeholder outreach to the water management people, state officials, federal officials, uh, and the stakeholders, uh, agricultural stakeholders, community stakeholders. To be able to bring uh, every to be able to bring people together and get over the political and policy hurdles and uh, and other uh, hurdles in terms of of, re of research uh, to be able to get solutions to a lot of a lot of these pressing uh, problems. Uh, I, let me turn it over for just a moment to uh, Enrique Villamor if I can find him. Let me see if I can find him real quick. Uh, there we go. Uh, Enrique, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, the uh, mathematical part of this and how important 
uh, just in a minute or two how important financial modeling of these various kinds of environmental risks uh, are? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, um, I think that uh, in modeling this type of uh, financial uh, instruments, I mean, the, 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 the people in the Department of Finance and um, we as mathematicians and and the people in environmental science, we can develop, I mean, like, uh, for instance, uh, Professor Kroll was mentioning this uh, level of phosphorus that needs to be in the water, um, um, so less than 10 some units. Uh, just for, as an example, I mean, something similar to the carbon emissions um, um, that um, the trading systems that they are being developed in Europe you can do something similar with this type of emissions. I mean, you can do some incorporating regulators and say that, uh, you know, look at all these people that they are putting these waters into uh, up in the north, that they are coming down and you are monitoring those things. And um, of course they had to do their business, of course, but in order to reduce those uh, water emissions so that the level of phosphorus would be the ideal one, uh, then you can regulate through those things and then you can put, put the price to those things and you can do some auctions uh, to those um, people that they are into this business in getting allowances if, if they need more. I mean, that, that's one example in the, in the uh, project for the Everglades restoration. I mean, it would be, I mean, there are many, many people that they will benefit from this type of restoration projects and they would be interested in, in providing, um, you know, income or, or or money to to uh, to give um, returns to investors, private investors that they would be interested in 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 buying this type of uh, bonds, if you want to call them this way, with some risk, uh, and they have they can be defined in so many different ways using finance and mathematics, uh, uh, so that it would be attractive to private investors, right? In and and these people have money, and you can show them that they are sound instruments that they can man. I mean that they properly manage the risk, uh, et cetera. I mean, uh, and they, then we will not be relying completely on taxpayers' money to fund these projects, right? So this is what, uh, what the, 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 the project, the uh, Environmental Finance and Risk Management Project within the Institute of Environment is trying to do, right? I mean, it's trying to um, train new people that they have a full understanding of these financial objects or instruments, right, with a training in finance and mathematics and, 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 and science, right, science, because it should be an interdisciplinary thing that, uh, that right now uh, we don't think that it, that it exists uh, in the people dealing with this. I mean, uh, finance people, they don't fully understand these things. So, and, and, and let me just add, Enrique, um, so, so here's an example of a disconnect between the will of the people and political taxation approaches. In 2015, the citizens of Florida voted to increase their taxes to provide funds to buy some of the sugarcane lands so that we could help um, uh, hasten um, Everglades restoration. But the Florida government failed to act on that in a timely manner. So even though they collected the funds, they didn't purchase the land. And then the sugar industry, the, the cost went back up, it became profitable again, and they took the offer off the table to sell the lands at a very low value. And so that's a disconnect between what people voted to do and what actually happened. And so when Enrique talks about you know investing in bonds and stuff, I, I, I hope, and, and Michael, I'd be interested in your perspective and Mario, um, I, I hope that takes the political step out of things because if people choose to invest in the environment, then those funds are in fact available to do the things that the people chose to invest in. And, and I hope that's how this works. <laughs> well, let me add that the capital market worldwide is something like $120 trillion. And it's not unusual for you know, $100 billion, $200 billion to vanish on a daily basis or be created, uh, they can easily handle hundreds of billions of dollars of fluctuation. So, cap, you know, if you want to shift the risk to the capital market, that would that can happen, but you just have to construct proper instruments, as Enrique said, some, you know, that will, uh, that investors will invest in. And that's uh, the, really the challenge to, to create the instruments that will shift the risk, environmental risk to the to the capital market. Capital market could simply absorb, uh, easily absorb those risks. 
Thank you. So thanks to the panelists for a, a great conversation. Hopefully uh, this is a conversation that we can uh, build upon and expand on. Um, this has been a very informative first panel on what will hopefully be a series of panels on this exact topic because uh, it's worth a lot of discussion. I just want to close with an invitation to our to our dwindling list of attendees, uh, particularly to the students. You know, one 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 of my lessons uh, in my time in government is um, that it it really doesn't take very long to get into a position where you're having a real impact on policy and a real and a real impact uh, a real impact on on the country and on the country's future. And so I would urge. Uh, all the students who care about these issues uh, to get involved in the environmental finance and risk management uh, program to get exposed to these other classes that are offered uh, across the university. Uh, don't be scared of math. Don't be scared of science uh, like I was early in college uh, because it's really fascinating and, um, and, and it's terribly important. And you know, we at the Environmental Finance and Risk Management Program, we're going to be working with the different the, the environmental students and environmental sciences, students in mathematics, students at the College of Law, to help uh, to help them see ways and to help get them involved in actual policymaking through internships uh, and fellowships and the like. Uh, you know, it's very easy to imagine one or more uh, of the students at FIU uh, being. Uh, at the White House, like Mike and I were uh, within a year or two, uh, even before graduation, uh, or at state government, and making a real a real impact, uh, a, a, a real impact. Um, there's a there's a demand for these ideas. There's a demand for a huge demand for getting the policies right. Uh, there's a lot of people that we have to protect and take care of that are vulnerable to these environmental challenges. Uh, in South Florida, it threatens you know our future as a community. Uh, in a way that uh, that is that is unfortunately almost unique uh, around the world. Uh, like I, as I like to say, South Florida faces a lot of global environmental challenges bigger and sooner than most of the rest of the world. So that's uh, something that I encourage uh, everyone to get involved in. Uh, I live in Surfside, as I said. One of my neighbors, climate change, uh, greeted me rudely the other night with flooding. Uh, in my street uh, on Tuesday night, I think it was, the mayor of Surfside had a mayor's roundtable to discuss what to do about flooding. And, uh, you know, that discussion fit right into the kind of frameworks and issues that we've been talking about here. The debate was between, you know, expanding the pipes and the pumps and the system for getting the water out of here and uh, the mayor, Mayor Burkett's insistence that the only really economical solution is going to be to raise these houses up uh, four, five, six feet. Uh, and of course, the objection to that was, well, we, are we going to have to pay for that ourselves? But as Mike explained, the federal government is moving towards, towards helping out with those kinds of hazard mitigation uh, measures uh, at a community level. And so we'll be moving forward with one of the suggestions that uh, that Mike uh, made the recently the recently enacted BRIC program uh, to see if uh, there can be federal funding for some of the efforts that Mayor Burkett has has in mind. And that's something that's a contribution that any any of the any student at FIU could make just as easily uh, getting involved with their local government. Uh, and so we hope to be developing those opportunities. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you very much to these panelists. Uh, you, you will all be punished with future invitations to, you'll be punished for your good, for your great contributions with more invitations to these panels. Uh, and that, and with that, thank you, uh, Dean Gomez for, uh, Associate Dean Gomez of the Law School for helping put this together. And I would turn over the floor to Devin Tibor for any last words uh, and the convocation. Uh, Devin, are you there? Mario, if I may interject yes. just with one one final, uh, one little comment. You know, we, we got sponsorship from the Environmental Law and Land Use section of the Florida Bar. Uh, and this is hopefully also the first in a series of efforts that we're going to do together with the Florida Bar or with sponsorship from the Florida Bar. Great. So with that, unless Devin wants to jump in in the next five seconds, I'll bring the meeting to a close. We have been recording this meeting. I should have mentioned that at the outset. I probably violated some law there. 
uh, but uh, uh, we will be sending around a link to all the participants uh, in the call. And with that, thank you very much and uh, have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.